Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. Good to have you guys with us. Lord, as we look at your word, we know that it is eternal, it is deep, it is incredibly meaningful. And we do not do you or your word a service if we rush in uh, with only a half heart. So I pray that you help us as we look, that you might reveal new and wonderful things about yourself and about our hearts toward you. So Lord, help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we've been going through the book of 1 John. We're in chapter 4, verses 13 to 21. Uh, the question that I have here is, are you bold and fearless? Bold and fearless. Two things that happen as a result of us having a proper understanding of who God is. But before we do that, we'll talk about last week. Last week, we covered verses 7 and following. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And in this, the love of God was manifest towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation or the provision for our sins. And beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. And by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. So we talked about love and tried to define it not from a societal point of view, but from a biblical point of view. And unconditional love, I think this is probably the best, the unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the good of another. So it's not selfish, it's not self-centered, it's not about you at all. It's about what you can give away and what you can do for the betterment of someone else. In fact, we looked in Philippians chapter 2, it's considering the needs of others above even your own. We also talked about how to increase our understanding of God's love, and I said you should go have dinner. Uh, I, I meant that you should have, like the Last Supper, you should do that and have communion, much like Jesus did. Now, we, we, we don't have to worry about social distancing or, or going on a Zoom, uh, but we can have this experience with the Lord, and he did so much more than just sharing a cup and bread and saying, this is my body, which was given for you and the blood which is poured out for you. And every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. He also washed their feet, which was emblematic of the forgiveness of sins. It's something that we enjoy as we come into a covenant with the Lord. So uh, we talked about that last week. This week, it's going to talk about being bold and fearless. Another aspect of God's love and how it's perfected in us and the benefits that it brings to us. Number one, verse 14, it says, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, but he hates his brother, he's a liar. And he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So John, as he typically writes, writes in cycles. And so he's talking about God's love and a completely different perspective. First thing is, he says, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. John is speaking as an eyewitness. He was there. If you remember when Jesus was at the uh, feast, John was the one who put his head on his breast and said, Lord, who's the one that betrays you? And Jesus actually told John, 
And when he told no one else, he said, the one who dips in the cup with me, he's the one who's going to betray me. And John was there to see all of that, uh, the youngest of all the disciples being closest to Jesus, so Jesus could kind of watch him and keep him protected from the other knuckleheads. If you also remember, John was the one also that was up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. He was one where so, saw Jesus's true essence revealed, and there was Moses and Elijah in the conversation that took place, and, and Peter rising up. Jesus and John had a very special relationship. So John's not telling us something secondhand or something that he heard. It's something that he saw, something that he knew. If you remember, it was John and Peter who ran to the tomb when they heard that Jesus' body was missing, and they ran. John got there first. Uh, of course, he's careful to mention that in the book of John, and Peter comes in afterwards. And so we see that John was intimately involved with the life of Jesus. He was also the one who wrote the book of Revelation, if you remember. So he was very, very much in touch with who Jesus was. It says here in 1 John 1, verses 1 to 4, it says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, another way of speaking of Jesus, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life with which with, with the father and was manifested to us that which we have seen and we have heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and our, truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ and these things we write to you that your joy may be full John says, we have seen, touched, handled, testify. All of these words are very, very strong. This isn't a made-up fable, and certainly all of the disciples having given their lives, none of them recanting everything that they knew and saw. John was telling us something that he knew intimately, not just as an outsider. And he says, the Father has sent the Son and that's something that God did. And it's interesting, there are people that don't believe that Jesus was God and man. They believe he was just a good man, that he was a, a teacher that we should listen to. And yet, how would it be if God took his only son and said, hey, listen, we got a world problem and we need to settle it, so uh, you go die for him. Uh, that seems a little callous. I wouldn't do such a thing, and, and I don't think I love my son in the degree in which God loves us. God himself came down in the person of his son and died in our stead through his son. So it's a very, very different thing than what the Mormons or the Jehovah Witnesses believe, that Jesus was just an angel or he was one of many gods. So God, the Father, has sent the Son. And if you think back to Abraham and all of the commonality between Abraham and Isaac and God the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, how he took the wood upon him and carried it up. And he said, well, Father, we have the fire, we have the, the wood, but where's the sacrifice? And he says, the Lord will provide the lamb, in which he did. And Jesus becomes that lamb much later on, on that very mountain in Mount Moriah. In Galatians 4, verses 4 to 7, it says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of a son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, or Daddy, essentially. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So Jesus came, abandoned his throne, and came down for us and died so that we might be able to have fellowship with him. It's an amazing thing, and that is the essence of the Christian religion. We're the only people that can actually approach God and go to heaven and not boast of our worthiness for it, because it doesn't rest on what we do. It rests upon what Jesus did at the cross. We also see that he attests that Jesus is the Savior of the world, not just that he was the God-man, he was fully man and fully God, but he was the Savior. Uh, to, to use the word Savior is interesting because you have to admit that you need to be saved. You have to admit that you are desperately and wickedly far from God and you need someone to make you right with him because in and of ourselves we can't do it. So we need someone else to do it for us and as a man, I don't like thinking I need somebody else to do anything for me. I like to be independent. And yet, 
Jesus came to be our Savior. No one comes to Jesus and says, yeah, I'm going to adopt his philosophy of living, but I'm not going to adopt him as Savior. Well, then you don't know Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, as you should. I think about Moses and all the commonality there is between Moses and Jesus. Moses came and delivered his people. He became the savior of those who were in Egypt, who were caught in slavery and bondage, and led them through the Red Sea and into the Promised Land, or at least up to the Promised Land. Uh, there was another one, another Yeshua, another Joshua, who was to lead them ultimately into the Promised Land over the Jordan. But all of the commonality, there was a fasting for 40 days, you'll see with Jesus and Moses. You'll see there was a healing of leprosy, both with Moses and Jesus. You'll see all of these common things between the two of them, if you put them together. Uh, I don't have enough time to do that, so I'll just move forward. He was the one that led them through the Red Sea as the Savior, and so they're very similar. Jesus himself, though, says, um, uh, said of Jesus in Titus 3, 4 to 6, but when the kindness and the love of our God, our Savior, toward man appeared... Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, we were saved not on the basis of anything that we did or our worthiness, but on the basis of God's love, period. If it was based on anything else, we would be able to pat ourselves in the back and say, you know, God did a good job in picking me. He picked a good guy. He, he picked a bunch of worthless nothings and made us worth something because he died for us. That's our value. Our value is not in and of ourselves. And he says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. There's confession, which is homologia, which is to say the same thing as God. It means you agree with what God says. You have to agree with everything that Jesus says to accept him as Lord and Savior and have this relationship, this fellowship. It's not just a pick and choose sort of thing. You accept the package or you don't. It's not like, yeah, I'm going to get married, but that whole being fidelitous and all, I'm not into it. Well, you have to accept it as a package or you don't or it won't work. So that's what it is. We have to admit that Jesus is the Son of God, God the Son. In John 8, 56 to 59, this is what Jesus says of himself. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. He was speaking to the Pharisees, who were boasting that they were right with God because of their ancestry. And then the Jews said to him, you are not 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? So they're mocking him. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now that's the Tetragrammaton. That is the, the sacred name of God, which even the rabbis would not write out all of the letters out of reverence for God's name. And so he called himself I Am, which is how God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. He is claiming himself to be God incarnate in a man's body. And then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and he went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so he passed by. So Jesus did the 100 yard dash and got the heck out of there, but it was because he claimed to be God, very God. And the, the Pharisees are always there when we're wondering what Jesus means. They get it, they understand it, and they show us exactly what Jesus said. He said, before Abraham was I am. I am the pre-existent one. I am the ever-present one. Jesus claimed himself to be God. And so if you accept Jesus as Savior and you accept him as the Son of God, you have to recognize everything that Jesus says about himself. If not, then you don't know God. You don't know him. It says here in Luke 5, 19 to 24, if you also remember the time when Jesus was at a, a very esteemed man's house, and as he began to speak, and all of the Pharisees were there, there were people that couldn't get this friend of theirs who was a paralytic to Jesus to be healed, and Jesus showed healing. So as everything was going on, you see a little bit of dirt dropping into the room from the ceiling, and here's guys digging themselves through the roof to lower their friend in front of Jesus so Jesus might heal them because of the crowds around the house. It says, and when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on a housetop and they let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And he saw their faith and he said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you. And if you know anything about anyone forgiving sins, you can forgive somebody's sins against you, but you can't forgive somebody's sins against everyone. 
you, somebody has sinned against you, you can forgive them, but you can't forgive someone of all of their sins. Only God does that. Jesus does it. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemes? Because he claims to be God. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, interesting, only God understands your thoughts, right? He answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk. By the way, rise and walk means that something's going to happen. If you tell somebody your sins are forgiven you, it doesn't necessarily mean that someone's healed and they're going to get up and walk away. So you can kind of get away with saying your sins are forgiven and nothing happened. And Jesus said, which is it easier to do? It's, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven instead of rise up and walk, which sounds very dramatic. Jesus did it for a very specific reason. He said, which is easier to say, rise up and walk? But you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, which only God does. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And that's exactly what he did. So you see what Jesus spoke, if it was blaspheme, God never would have honored what he said by healing this man. And yet God was the one who healed this man. Because Jesus is who he says he is. When you call him the Son of God, when you call him the Savior, it shows that you have a right understanding of who Jesus is. In John chapter 8, you'll notice uh, there was a woman that was thrown at the feet of Jesus and the Pharisees trying to entrap him said, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery, right in the middle of the act. And the, the, the law of Moses says that we should stone her to death. What do you say? As they were trying to entrap him. So Jesus saw they were all ready for a stoning. They had stones and they were all ready to go. And so Jesus stooped down and just began writing in the ground, writing in the dust. And there's a lot of people that conjecture what he was writing. But then as he stood up, as they were all quiet, he said, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And it says, beginning with the oldest to the youngest, they all dropped their rocks and they went their way. So it's a really interesting story. Here are all of these who were bloodthirsty, much like the riots that are going on right now in the name of justice. They wanted to do what they thought was justice, and yet they weren't doing it in the prescribed fashion. You're supposed to bring the man and the woman, and there's supposed to be two witnesses, two or three witnesses, and they're the ones to throw the stones first because they know for sure that it happened because they were eyewitnesses. None of this took place. So it was a, uh, just trying to subjugate um, justice. And so when they heard and they were convicted by their conscience, they went out one by one, beginning with the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What a great blend of truth and love Jesus put together. I don't condemn you either. Don't do it anymore. He wasn't saying she was innocent. He was saying that she was guilty because he knew. But he's saying, I forgive you. Repent. And repentance is more than just swearing that you'll never do it again. It's asking God for the power to never repeat it. And that's a very different thing. But I digress. And it says here that, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. There is this resultant relationship because we have an understanding of who Jesus is and we confess him as he is, we receive him as he is, a Savior and the Son of God, that we have fellowship with God, this abiding or living with God that is like nothing else. I think of uh, just walking with Jesus and and. Uh, having a conversation with him daily, having uh, praying and lifting up your heart. And if you have a relationship with the Lord, you know what this is like, where you're having a dialogue. You're, you're speaking to the Lord and he's speaking to your heart about things that you should do or you shouldn't do. And he guides us and leads us and walks along with us. That's a result of having a right understanding of having a true theology that knows who Jesus is as he is, not fudging it and trying to pretend that he's something less than what he said he is. So when this happens, we have this abiding, this living fellowship with him. His spirit is inside of us and it is a rich reception that we have from him and we abide in him. 
It is the best place to be. And when we choose to live in sin and when we hide those things in our life, we disrupt that. It's like a cloud between you and the sun. And it's just nothing like being right with God and having a, a, a confessed heart before him. So moving on in verse 14, I'm uh, in John chapter 15. This is what Jesus teaches about abiding. And the word abiding means to live with. So it says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. He's speaking to his disciples. Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. One of the benefits of having that fellowship with God is having your prayers answered. And by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commands, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and abide in his love. It's not like if you don't submit to God in every aspect of your life, he doesn't love you anymore. It's he can't love you in the way that he would like to because you can't be trusted with the blessings that he would otherwise give. So it's about being under the spout where the blessings come out. It's not about God's heart toward you or his relationship to you. It's about his blessings for you so that you might bear fruit for his namesake. Moving on to verse 16. And we have known and believed the love of God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him, just as we have gone over. Notice that this gift of God's love has to be received, just like any other sort of a gift. It doesn't do you any good if you don't uh, receive it. If somebody told you they had a million dollars in an account for you, gave you the account um, on, on a set of checks, and you never wrote a check and never took anything out, it certainly would not be in your possession. You might have a right to it, but you, it wouldn't be yours. And it's the same way with the love of God. It is something that has to be received. There is faith that needs to be mingled with this. There's action that needs to happen. So as we do that, we see that God's love abides in us and we in him. In verse 17, God has been perfected. God's love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. It's a rather interesting statement. As he is, we are in this world. So love is perfected in us. By the way, God is, should be, always be perfecting his love in you. That's the object of why he claims us as his own. Perfected in us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So God wants us to be perfectly loving so that when we get there and we see him, we won't be embarrassed. When we come before the Lord, when you breathe your last and you leave this earth, you will have nothing to boast of as you stand before God. And if he were to ask you, why should I let you into my kingdom? Your only answer should be, I don't belong here. I don't deserve this. I haven't earned it. I am a filthy, dirty, rotten, twisted sinner. I was born that way. I lived that way. That, that should be our only understanding of our standing before a holy, perfect God. And yet, as we come before him, we humbly confess that we have received a free gift, the gift that Jesus put out there for us, which is the gift of eternal life, that he has adopted us into his family. And that changes our hearts, it changes our minds, it changes our lives, our speech, everything about who we are. So, we have this boldness because as we show love towards other people and as we're able to do that in a sacrificial way, not in a, in a surface way or in a way that is uh, kind of trite or self-serving, but in a way that's really self-sacrificing, you can't do that unless you know the Lord. You can't give something away unless you have it. It's like COVID. 
You can't give it away unless you have it. Well, it's the same thing with the love of God. And it's because on the day of judgment, you're not going to stand before God and feel like you're standing there naked and everyone's laughing. You don't have to worry about Judge Judy turning on you and, and uh, you know, yelling obscenities at you and calling you a loser and everything else. But God is going to be able to say, welcome into my kingdom. And there are going to be rewards for the things that we've done. And the only difference between other people and us is that we've been forgiven. And so we have the love of God in our hearts that we give away. And because it's a gift we've received, we give it away left and right because there's always more and there's a constant supply through the Lord. So as God is, so we are. It, it means God is loving and he's up in heaven. And because he's not here right now, we are as his representatives. We behave like him in being loving. And in doing so, we show that the love of God has been given to us and we show that we're truly his children and his disciples as it should be. And that's the difference between somebody that really knows the Lord and somebody that just wears a name tag. So what do you think would stop you from believing in God's love? It's a good question to ask yourself. If you were to find out or if I was to find out I had cancer today and I had two weeks to live, would that make me doubt God's love? Or if I had a child who died, or a loved one who died, or if some tragedy occurs, would I question whether God still loves or God is love? What would make you turn away from that thought? It's an interesting thought. And I think like the Apostle Paul, the, the Apostle Paul says, I know that there will be nothing that will separate me from the love of God, not height or depth or principalities or powers. Or, there's nothing that will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And I don't know about you, but we've all got to check out of this body somehow. And so something's going to happen. Something's going to happen to you. Something's going to happen to me. Something's going to happen to everyone. Does that mean that God doesn't love? Or maybe it shows his love because he wants to take you home and he wants to give you a new body. And you've had enough of living in the old one. I'd be, I'd be willing to go. They could take me now. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. This is deep. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Another aspect of love is that there's no fear in love. If you say that you love God, there won't be this dread of facing him. There won't be this trepidation of, oh no, if Jesus were to come tonight, I'm not ready, or I haven't done enough, or I'm not good enough. Perfect love, an understanding of God's love for you, casts out all fear. So what are you afraid of? Draculia? I mean, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid of losing control? Uh, are you afraid of an accident? Are you afraid of a disease? Are you afraid of a riot? Are you afraid of assassination, being shot, uh, becoming a vegetable and living the rest of your days horizontal? Uh, what is it that you're afraid of? I can tell you that when you get afraid, you are not thinking about the love of God that he has for you. Because perfect love casts out all fear. So whatever it is that you're afraid of or twisted up about, and goodness sake, with the riots going on and with COVID running rampant and all of the things that we have running on around our lives, there are lots of things that can grip us and make us afraid. And yet, when we understand that God works all things together for good for those that love him, that are the called according to his purpose, and you understand God's love for you, that every single thing that happens to us has a purpose behind it and it has his signature, that he's allowing it to happen or he's caused it to happen for your good. You begin to look beneath the surface and start to say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do with this thing? And I can tell you, every one of us has that struggle. And you'll always have that question, what will separate you from the love of God? What will separate you? Well, fear is one of those things that could separate you. And it's because you don't understand the love of God fully. So I like this statement. It says, love like you've never been hurt. Uh, anybody that loves gets hurt. It's the nature. You're going to show love towards somebody and they are not going to return it. Unrequited love. It is the makings of every Greek drama, uh, of every Greek tragedy, uh, Euripides, uh, 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 all of them. 
essentially. Somebody dies, it's terrible, it's tragic, uh, there's unrequited love, and it's, it's, it's a miserable thing. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, all of the above. So what happens when we love people? Well, if you're loving with God's love, it's unconditional. You're not looking for a return. It's something that you give and you let go of. You can't get hurt doing that. You can't get hurt. You just have to let it go. So love like you've never been hurt. It takes a strong heart to love, but it takes an even stronger heart to continue to love after it's been hurt. And people will hurt your feelings. I, I've been hurt many times. I've, uh, I've had people be critical, judgmental. I've had people talk behind my back. I've had people um, do harsh, horrible, terrible things that I won't go into because um, you might be listening. But uh, bottom line, what do you do when you're hurt? You've got to lift it to the Lord and say, Lord, what do I do with this thing? Because sometimes you just don't figure it out. And you can be completely 100% right and still get hurt. That's the nature of love. It shouldn't be that we're looking to get something out of it. And that's usually what it is. Our expectations are, hey, I did this, I expect that. It's not like that. It's not in any relationship that I know. A business relationship, perhaps, but not in an agape sort of love. So, I don't want someone who sees the good about me. I want someone who sees the bad and still loves me. Isn't that the cry of every single human being? You don't want somebody to just see the good things about you and love you for those things. And then as soon as they see something that's bad about you, they go, I'm done with you. I had no idea beneath the surface you were such a wretched human being. But to understand that God knows every sin that we'll ever commit and how we turn our back and how we're rebellious, even in our very nature. And yet God sent his son to die for me, for you. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. In 2 Timothy 1, 6, 7 says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He's speaking to Timothy, Paul is. He says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. It seems as though Timothy was a bit timid. Uh, I remember it because Timothy and timid are spelled similar. Timothy was a bit timid, and so Paul had to kind of jab him a little bit and said, listen, you've got a calling, you've got something you need to do, and I prayed over you, and you better get to do it. Uh, that's the way I would say it in Jersey, but uh, that's the way he said it in the scriptures. So he says, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. If you have a spirit of fear, you haven't been perfected in love yet, because perfect love, a right understanding of God's love, and a right love towards other people casts out all fear. If somebody comes and gets in my face and yells and screams and gets all upset, and yet I understand God's love for me and that he's got my back, he's going to protect me and take care of me, they won't intimidate me. They won't make me feel bad. If somebody cuts me off on the highway and I instantly, you know, my instincts kicked in and, and I want to give them a single-fingered salute or, you know, worse yet, run them off the road into a, you know, into a ball of fire and watch them die. The imagination is a powerful thing. What happens is if... I trust God in that moment. If I understand the love of God in that moment, I will act without the fear. I will act as best as I possibly can as my reactions will allow me to, and yet I won't have the fear. And I've had it happen. I've, I've reacted out of fear and, uh, because I'm not in control, and I hate that. And I've also reacted in a way that's loving because I have a sense of God's presence. And I can tell you the latter is much better. And if you've experienced that, you know what I mean. We love him because he first loved us. Why do we have love in our hearts as Christians, as those who follow Jesus? It's because God loves us. <coughs> Excuse me. You may have had the most rotten example of love in your household. You may have had the most rotten example of love in your marriage. You may have had the worst family dynamics of anybody that's ever lived. And yet, when you look at Jesus and you understand who God is, you will know love. And when you receive him as your Lord and your Savior, he changes you to the place where you can love people in a right way. And then he teaches us how to do that. Not only does he give us a new hard drive, but he constantly is purifying our software. So I'm grateful for that. It is our response to him. Love is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person. To love somebody isn't just a strong feeling. It's a decision. It's a judgment. And it's a promise. Love is not just a strong feeling, although strong feelings go with it. It's a commitment that I will do that which God has empowered me to do, and I will be obedient to do what he's done. Out of love, not out of service or some kind of servitude or slavery. But because he set me free, 
I am free to love other people and they can get in my face, they can cut me off on the highway, all of the above. I don't have to respond in fear because perfect love casts out all fear. You cannot give this kind of love unless you have received it, like the virus. If you don't have it, you can't give it away. So, John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus said, you know, abide in me and I in you because apart from me you can do nothing. If, if I'm not abiding in the vine, who's Jesus, if I am as a branch not getting my nutrients fed to me from him spiritually, then I'm not going to have what it takes to love people. So when I end up being shallow and short, I realize it's because I'm not abiding. I'm not living in the vine. I'm not living in his presence. And unfortunately, uh, that does happen. So if you've been a recipient of that, I apologize. Verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Not about the hating the brother part, but about loving God. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? If you remember all the way back in, in, in um, the first chapter of Genesis, God created everything and he creates man and he creates woman. He creates mankind, if you will, in his image. That's an interesting term that God would use to put down what he did when he created us. It says that he breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living being. Something different than the animals. There's a piece of God in us that we're created in his image. We see, we feel, we, we have all sorts of things that God has. We're parallel with him. In Genesis 1, 27, it says, So God created man in his own image and in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. He created man, by the way, it's mankind, it's, it's, it's all the genus of human beings. So he's created us in his image. Uh, so follow me on this. If God has created us in his image, we read Deuteronomy 5, 8 to 10 a little bit differently. It says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations and to those who hate me, and showing mercy to, those, to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So God says, don't make any graven image and bow down and worship it. Doesn't mean you can't take pictures, you can't, carve stuff, doesn't mean that. It means that you can't make it your God and bow down and worship it. Why not? Because if you look around, you'll see images of God everywhere. They're human beings. You don't have to make one out of wood or stone and bow down and worship it, and you certainly shouldn't bow down and worship a human being. But if human beings are made in the image of God, it would, it would stand a reason why God said, don't make a graven image and bow down and worship it. Um, some people do worship other people but not because they're made in the image of God, but because they've substituted them for God. So it's an interesting thing, being made in the image of God. Most of what it is for us to do what the scripture says, to love our brother, has to do with reconciliation. Because there's friction everywhere. In every relationship, there's going to be some conflict. If not, then you're not doing it right. There's going to be conflict. And so what do you do when you have trouble with somebody? Well, you can be like some people and just fester it and be angry and be unforgiving and carry it around like so many leftovers in your fridge that have been there for years and it just does not work out well. Or you can forgive them. That's a much more difficult thing to do. And of course, you haven't been forgiven, forget it. You don't know how to forgive. You don't know what it is. Uh, you need Jesus. So here's the steps, guys, to reconciling with people. There are four common steps that I'd like you to think about. Number one, I was wrong. Now, men, this might be difficult for you, but if you've done something wrong and you've hurt somebody's feelings and you did something that was wrong, said something that was wrong, you need to say, I was wrong. Two people can't walk up to each other after an argument. They said all sorts of vile things that are piled up to the sky and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All that means is I don't feel rage like I want to kill you anymore. That's all that means. It doesn't mean anything about change. It doesn't mean that you were wrong. You're not taking any responsibility for your own actions, and you're not cleaning up your mess. And so it will be there the next time emotions are stirred, and it will be twice as big as it was before. So maybe you've run into this. Maybe you do this today, even. But I was wrong. 
You need to admit and take responsibility for doing wrong. Number two, I am sorry. Sorry is good, but not all by itself. Sorrow, understanding what you've done, how to, you've hurt somebody, you've taken something from them, or you've thrust something upon them that was not your right to do. For you to understand how that person hurts and for you to commiserate with them is right. And so you should. You shouldn't say, I was wrong, sorry. That's not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. No, the, the, no, no, no. Real sorrow comes from a contrition. It's an understanding what I've done is hurtful and I'm truly, I understand what I've done and the repercussions and I am sorrowful for it. If I could go back in time, I wouldn't do it again. That sort of thing. Number three, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Because you're asking the other person to drop their rock, the rock that they could throw at you forever and ever and ever. And people like to do this. They like to remember things that you've done wrong and throw them back at you. I don't know if this has ever occurred. You may have never asked someone to forgive you. That might be why they can't seem to forget. So guess what? You want them to drop the rock? Tell them to forgive you. Say, can you forgive me? Please forgive me. I, I, which means I don't think about it, I don't talk about it, I don't mention it to anybody else, and it's dead, it's buried at the bottom of the sea, it's as far as the east is from the west, it's a done deal. Please forgive me. And number four, I will not do it again. This is a bit harder, because whatever it is that you did, you need to think about, how can I not do this again? This is the process of reconciliation. How is it that you can forgive somebody who says, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me, I'll probably do it again tomorrow. That's why the second time you have the argument, it will be twice as big because you haven't cleaned it up and you haven't repented. Now, by the way, these are the good old biblical religious words for it. Confession, contrition, restoration, and repentance. So I tried to give it to you in the Jersey lingo, and now you have it in the biblical lingo. It is confession. It is contrition, meaning you feel contrite about it, you feel bad about it. Restoration, which is please forgive me. You need to restore things back to where they were, where there wasn't this three, you know, two strikes against you. And repentance, which is I turn 180 degrees and go in the other direction, and I don't do what I did. You guys got it? Okay. And this is the commandment that we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. If you say you love God, you got to love your brother. And it's not an option. It's an absolute commandment. God says this is a have to. It's not like you're looking at a menu board and saying, hmm, what in the Bible do I want to obey and what don't I want to obey? Or like you're going through the buffet line and you say, gee, what looks good to me today? I think I'll avoid the pig feet, you know, and, and I'll eat the other things. It's, it's not like that. This is a non-negotiable. In fact, it is one of the most foundational things. But Jesus was asked, what, what do we have to do? You know, what are the greatest commandments? How do you break it down, Jesus? And he said, that's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two hang all the law and the prophets. You want to boil the Bible down? That's it. Love God with all you have and love your neighbor the way you love yourself. You take care of yourself pretty well, you treat yourself pretty well, that's the way you should treat other people. So use that as an example. If you beat yourself up, you need mental health or counseling. So we'll work on that if you need it. But here's the thing, it is a command. It is not an option. If you say that you're a Christian and you say that you love God, you have to love other people in an agape, in an unconditional sort of way, or your testimony is just worthless. I mean, makes sense, right? All of this stands to reason. What we went over today from verse 14 says, and we have this, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love of God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and he hates his brother, he is a liar. And he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, 
How can he love God whom he has not seen? And his commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So there is this thing where perfect love casts out all fear. And as we are perfected in love, there's a boldness that comes upon us that we can stand before God, not in the sense of our own righteousness, but because we have this resultant relationship that wells up in love for other people. That's evidence that he lives in us. There is no greater testimony that you can give than unconditional love to someone else, that Jesus Christ is real and that he's alive in your life. I pray that, Lord, that you would enlarge in our hearts, that you would help us to be loving, that you would give us a concept of how deep is your love, that we might understand it and personify it in all that we do and say for the glory of you and your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.